Greetings, my name is JC. And I'm Ian. And this is the Gamer's Guide, Dan. In this episode, we're going to be uh, talking about education in video games. We're going to talk about a little bit of our history, a little bit about education in different types of games and stuff like that. We're going to so get learned. We're going to get learned it. yeah. Uh, but uh, before we get SMRT, uh, what game have you been playing this week? I have been playing a lot of Fire Emblem. Okay, cool. Three Houses. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because it came out at the same time as Wolfenstein. Yep. Obviously, if you watched it all last week, we played a ton of Wolfenstein. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have a chance to play any Fire Emblem. Yep. But over the course of this week, I got full into that. Cool. I'm about uh, I'm about 20 hours in, but not as far, I guess, as I should be. Okay. I've been grinding a lot of combat. Um, yeah, you were saying that you're like four or five levels ahead of the characters that you're fighting? I'm a good chunk ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, I've been trying to like get all my stats up with, or my, I guess, relationships mm-hmm. raised up with people so I can get uh, have the support conversations to get my support skills up so I can get people recruited to my house. Cool. It is complicated. Yeah. Very complicated, but it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been really enjoying it. Uh, the characters are engaging. There's a few that are a little samey. Okay. Um, there's definitely a couple that I can easily get mixed up. Mm-hmm. But uh, for the most part, a lot of them are, like, it's a pretty wide variety of characters. Oh, okay. Those samey characters are just, like, the same, like, uh, anime dudes with a different haircut or something like or, that? Or girls. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah, there's a couple of dudes that are a little similar. Right. There's a couple of ladies that are a little similar. It's like they just ran out of... um, That's pretty typical in anime, though, so... Yeah. Yeah, especially for support characters, too. Like, Mm -hmm. they're not... With such a huge cast like that, eventually you're going to run into people that are just like, which one were you again? Yeah. Um, So what's the gameplay like? Have you played any of the older Fire Emblems? Is it pretty similar, or...? um, I, I played the first one. Okay. The very first Fire Emblem... I, You're talking about the Super Nintendo one, or? Uh, oh, I guess I'm not. No, I didn't play the very first one. <laughs> I played the I played the Game Boy Advance. Okay. The first one on the Game Boy Advance. Yep. Um, because so I'm like, oh, this looks cool. I I love, I really like um like turn based RPGs. Yeah. Uh, the like strategy, RPGs. Yeah, because it has some Shining Force elements and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm like, this is cool. Um, and I. Probably got a good, good five to ten hours in because the old ones just had like conversations, right? And then combat. Yeah, they were a little bit more linear. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could move around on the map. You could go back and do fights over again, but okay. Again, for the most part, it was fairly straightforward. Right. Um, and then one of my characters died. Oh, okay. In combat, and they were gone, and I'm like, like gone. <laughs> The permadeath got to you. And I'm like, well, I'm done. That's <laughs> yikes. <laughs> that's it. Okay. I'm like, it was, it was a character that I really liked. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who it was. It was one of the mounted characters, and I'm like, yeah, they're so sweet. Like all the damage just ride in, like bam. Right. Then gone. I'm like, all played right. a little bit too risky with them. The Forget one. it. This game. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with this game. That's fair tossed it on the shelf and never looked back but i don't know something about this one there was no autosave feature though right you could have just i guess i could have gone and loaded an old save yeah but long battles it gets to you it does man yeah it really I've, does I've, 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 I've had moments like that where I, I want all the characters to survive and because you know you're in the middle of a dungeon and you have to either like go back and res them or restart or load from a different save point it's like that was an hour ago I yeah i want to do it yeah and th- uh, that was one of my issues with wargroove when it first came out was there was no auto save throughout the fight oh okay so and if your captain gets killed mm-hmm. th- that that's a whole battle done so yeah you, yeah you could have spent an hour and a half in that and yeah it's more of a traditional mechanic really it is and it yeah. i mean it's because the uh, newer games are a little bit more forgiving with that, but games that are older or games that are kind of influenced by um, older games or that have been around for a really long time, so they ha- still have these mechanics. It's yeah, it's it's, it's that it's different. the philosophy of like get good. Mm-hmm. Um, they do not value your time whatsoever. <laughs> They're just like yeah, be better, right? Do it again. And yeah. we, I don't know, I don't have time to 
I did when the first Fire or when the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem came out. I for sure had the time. <laughs> but uh, fair enough. No. I, anyways, so this is probably my first Fire Emblem mm-hmm. in a long time. Like I, I, I picked up Awakening okay. on the 3DS. Maybe, oh, okay. I maybe played an hour of it. My um, one friend played that one uh, through like the there's three versions of that I think, and he pl- he played through both or all three of them or whatever it was but no there was the conquest it was conquest something and uh, i don't know awakening was i think the first 3ds one okay and i have one for the wii Mm -hmm. as well that i've never played okay like keep that one it's worth a lot of money is it really it's like a hundred dollar game no way i don't even remember where i got i i would have got it when it came out but i i bought it brought it home and like oh put it put you on the shelf when I maybe will play you at some later point, I never did. But anyways, this one is super good. And like I said, I'm 20 hours in. Yeah, really working the support relationships uh, as well as grinding combat mm-hmm. um, and building up skills. Like the story's decent enough. You have to pick right. one one of three potential arcs. Okay. So what are the arcs? Um, it'd be the, the three houses. Okay. Uh, as suggested so you, by the game, so you have a you've got a female uh, run house, which is the Black Eagles. Mm-hmm. There's the Blue Lions, okay. um, run by your very typical anime dude, mm-hmm. blonde guy with uh, spiky hair. Uh, I think he's got a side shave, so oh, okay. spiky enough in yep. places. And then you've got uh, oh, what is the other one? What is the one that I don't care about? <laughs> the one you're not playing through. Yeah, Black Eagles is the one that I'm going through because oh, okay. I saw a lot of people doing when I was before I bought it. A lot of the people I saw playing through were doing the Blue Lions, which granted there is a time skip halfway through the game and everybody like ages up. Oh, okay, um, which is kind of cool, right? And uh, yeah, I I liked I liked the way that the Blue Lions house leader looked when they age up. Mm. He's got an eye patch and it's badass. <laughs> nice. But uh, a little bit of um, skies of Arcadia. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit of that. There. You so, got the... Yeah, there's the golden deer is the one that you forgot. The golden deer. How did I forget the golden deer? That sounds really cool. It and you know what? It's it's kind of interesting because the the head of the head of the black eagles mm-hmm. is um, the future ruler of the empire. Okay. Um, and then you have the head of the blue lions Mm -hmm. who will be the future ruler of that territory i can't remember Mm -hmm. um and then the the golden deer he i mean he's going to be a leader of sorts but it's like a merchant alliance oh okay um which i was just like i was like cool he's like He's. I think he's like going to be a duke or something. Oh, okay. Or like, like just a, a an odd title. Right. And like the one dude's like, I'm going to be king of whatever, and mm-hmm. uh, the girl's like, you know, ruler of the Adrestian Empire, and then he's just like, like yeah, I'm going to be a duke of uh, Merchant Alliance, you know, <laughs> a little bit of trading, a little bit of. Uh... Everyone has their own dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just. Uh, it didn't. Uh, didn't seem to have the same punch. He's an interesting character. Mm-hmm. Like I enjoy um, the few like conversations and interactions I have with him. Right. They're not obviously that great. Mm. Just something about it. It just seems a little bit dry. The other ones seem to have real purpose behind them. Right. Whereas his seems a little bit more um, loose. I guess is the term. Yeah. I I tend to find with these types of games where they have like multiple paths to play through that there's usually more canonical ones and then less canonical ones. So yeah. there might be like if there's five, then maybe two of them are sort of like what I'm what I'm calling non um canonical, which they're just not as uh um important to the lore or like impactful to the lore for example or the story that's going on and there's some of them that are more um fleshed out um so to speak that they seem a little bit more canonical same with like relationships in certain um role-playing games as well where if you play through 
um, playing with one character versus another character in a romance, then some of them are just not as fleshed out. Some of them are just as interesting, but I mean, like, in the amount of dialogue that there is or the uh, amount of events that happen with that character and stuff like that. Um, like how Mass Effect assumes if you're a female character, you're just going to date Garrus. Well, everybody who's female is going to be dating Garrus. Yeah. Garrus, but, yeah. I don't get it. I don't get it. Someone explain it to me. I do. It's fine. It's just Birdman. I don't get it. I don't get it. He looks like a cat. Anyways. Well, maybe that's part of it. That's enough about me talking <laughs> about, well, roundabout talking about Fire Emblem Three Houses. I will have more to say um, probably next week. I'm hoping to finish it over the course of this week and uh, mm-hmm. be able to dive into um, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Oh, okay, cool. A little bit, because I did pick that up prior to Wolfenstein as well. But I Yeah, did... you mentioned you got uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance uh, and then whenever we were playing um, Wolfenstein. I'm like, really? Oh, that's cool. July but... was July was like a packed month because yeah. you had like week after week of like huge things. Well, the huge kids things. are out for summer, so it gives them a handful of games to play. But it's funny because traditionally the summer's been a, a almost like a dead I would time say for video games is usually dead and then there's i've always remembered like one or two big titles coming out in the summer but this was like big because we there was dragon quest builders at the beginning of the month mm-hmm. and then the following week you had um ultimate alliance 3 mm-hmm. then you had wolfenstein and fire emblem three houses mm-hmm. like it was just like back to back to back to back yeah this year has been pretty good with the summer and i'm just like I'm done. I don't know what comes out this week, and I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to play through some of the stuff. I'm going to play through what I got and then move on. Be ready for Astral Chain next week or next month and the right. and then the huge, like, September, October, November monstrous yeah. wave of, like, AAA titles. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, enough about that. What were you playing this week, JC? Uh, so over the week, I've been playing a little bit more League. Um, got back into that a little bit. Ooh. Uh, haven't been playing my main account. My friend has been also helping me level up my alt account. Okay. Um, so I've been playing that on and off. Uh, played a good uh, few sessions with it. Um, yeah, just been kind of having fun with that. It's now, are been... you playing a different role no. on that account? Or you still okay? Are you playing a different support <laughs> at least? No. Okay. All right. No, it, it's kind of funny because there's a huge divide between... So the account is level 17, I think, now. But the interesting thing about it is you can tell the divide between new players who are like trying to learn the game and then players who are just trying to level up another account. It, it's 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 really funny. Um, and every now and then I kind of feel bad for them because like w- we played one game and there was this top laner and they were playing a fairly good matchup, but they're against a Riven and anybody who um, plays a game has heard the meme like of uh, solo top Riven mains. And <laughs> if they're really good, they tend to be very, very good. <clears throat> this was one of them. They were like, like 15 plus kills, but they, it, you always play against them. They're never on your team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's but, like a Yasuo. Yeah, exactly. And him and his one in ten power spike. But the <laughs> the this one game, I, I felt kind of bad for the one guy because he was zero and eight oh. on our team, our top laner, and oh. the like. He he I've been there to to their credit, they didn't rage or anything like that, and nobody raged to them. That and, that's actually yeah. Not only that he didn't or they didn't rage. Yeah. That nobody else raged at them. Yeah. And that's amazing. You know, I was just like, I'm like, uh, keep your head in it. We'll try and scale. Cause I had like five kills and my ADC had like three and we were doing fairly well. And I'm like, maybe we'll be able to get them. I'm pretty sure we lost that game, but regardless, it, it was still a well fought battle. And then, uh, another interesting story about um, low elo stuff. There was a Zyre and Rakan dual bot lane that we were fighting, and um, it was obvious that they were um, partnered together, but the Rakan was new. And uh, I didn't really notice at first because it was kind of just reacting to how they played. But the Zaya was silver too, and the Rakan okay. was like level seven or eight or something like that. Okay. And he kept on engaging in with his uh, knockup. And it was just kind of funny because 
I just kept on reacting to him and just um, over punishing him for what he was doing. And then he would keep on backing. And then we would like really uh, hard push the, the Zaya into the lane and uh, every now and then kill her. And there was one moment where he, he did a combo that wasn't engaged because like we had vision on the jungler who was sitting in the river bush and he he basically did a combo straight into in in between us and he did it so badly that i'm like (laughs) if you knew how to play the support role you probably wouldn't have done what you just did and uh i i I wish i had specific video footage of this because it was kind of funny but then i i ended up basically one-shotting him because i basically i had everything up and i just comboed him with everything in my alt and ignite and uh yeah i i felt bad at that point because i was just like oh actually this guy's like really new (laughs) i I thought they were just leveling up an account and he was like trying out trying out rakan but i'm like no like he there's no way he would have done that if he like was a support main and like the silver elo or something like that as well It, it just it, it, it was it was a little bad and there was yeah every now and then there's good clown fiestas where I, i'm kind of enjoying it because the play is a lot different with lower elo people especially if you have like a mix of low elo and high elo people there's one game where we had a um, uh, galio mid and then a yumi uh support and we basically uh combo wombo comboed together the two of us their adc and we did that twice in a row and i guess the yumi kind of got salty and they went mid lane so then what i ended up doing was matching their roam and i'm like because i was on comms with the bot laner uh because i queued in with them and i'm like you've got the bot laner right it's just them i'll go mid and help out um the the mid laner because the mid laner died twice almost immediately against the two of them because it was so like oppressive for them because it was yeah. an Irelia and a uh, Yumi uh, mid lane basically at that point. So then it was the two of us, and then I helped him get uh, a kill and a, and uh, an assist because I got the other kill. Um, and yeah, uh, and it was kind of funny because Yumi was like, "Why don't you go back to your lane?" I'm like, "I'm I'm matching your roam. Like, yeah. What, what what do you want?" <laughs> <laughs> you have a two v one mid. Like, yeah, what do you want? But it was pretty obvious that that mid laner was um, was a new player as well. And they're actually like talking out in chat, like, "Oh, thanks so much." And then they kept on like alting because um, they're a Galio. They kept on alting into the bot lane, like helping <laughs> us out because I helped them out. Yeah. And then there was like, yeah, constant like three v three mid lane and bot lane, like back and forth. It, it, it was kind of entertaining. And that game ended up being pretty close. So it was it was kind of cool because those. Uh, random incursions of things that happen with uh uh just random ideas and just different levels of skill play you never really know what's going to happen necessarily because people aren't playing the way that you expect them to and yeah. sometimes it just makes the game uh I- enjoyable in a different way so i'm kind of enjoying leveling up this account but uh yeah so that's been uh my my uh, adventures in in league in the last week yeah but anyway enough about what we've been playing uh let's get into the segment for this week Let's get learned. Yeah, let's get learned. So the um, first thing we wanted to talk about was our history in educational video games. Um, I guess uh, the first game that we'll um, we'll start with is uh, Carmen San Diego. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I played some of this when I was a kid. Well, this was a really really big game. Uh, what was interesting about this game is uh, not only did it come with like a uh, encyclopedia um, thing with it. To help you answer all the questions and stuff like that at the end of the game, uh, it had its own TV show. It had like a theme song based and it on had it. A, it had a game show. Yeah, like a kids game show. Yeah, yeah, and there was Not War in Time, cartoon, and like... there was War in the World, and a bunch of different spinoffs and stuff like that. And the first time that I ever played this game was um, either grade three or grade four, and they had they had it on the school computer. Um, this and the next game that we'll talk about. But um, yeah, I just, I, I found it really, really interesting because it was kind of cool because e- I learned so much about geography and I didn't even realize that I was learning so much about geography because we used to play this map game in school where it was like, uh, point out like Algeria. And then the first person to like hit it on the map would be like the person who got the point, for example. And you do best um, twos or threes or el- uh, single elimination knockout. And then somebody would be like, the winner or whatever and you just go through all the classmates basically um and and i felt that that game helped that and the board game risk but the um <laughs> well, some of those countries didn't exist anymore no they didn't but uh uh yeah it was kind of neat because yeah it, it 
helped you with different questions and it taught you different trivia and stuff like that and geography and i thought the game was kind of fun it was um uh, one of the games that I wanted for the computer and actually eventually got a copy for uh, on our home, um, like a 286 computer. But uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, because I, 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 I didn't have a, like, we didn't have a home PC mm-hmm. until I was probably um, maybe like 11 or right. 12. So I, I didn't ever get to play these unless I went to someone's house who had a computer or it happened to be on one of the school computers. Yeah. Um, I was super cool and did go to computer camp. Cool. Uh, probably when I was like, I don't know, made grade two or three. Um, yeah. Computer camp. <laughs> it's where gingers go to the, during the summer. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't really get the full experience of actually having it, but it was like, you'd go over to someone's house and they're like, yeah, let's play computer games. And mm-hmm. you're like, sweet. And it's like, yeah, let's play Carmen San Diego. Right. And like, you're like excited about it. Cause it's a video game. Right. But yeah, you're like getting taught stuff and <laughs> not sure how you feel about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, Oh, I yeah. learned something, mm-hmm. but I was too young to be offended by it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the the other game that uh, I liked playing a lot, and they had these on the Macs at school, um, was Math Blaster. Yep. And I remember playing, there was like two versions of this. There's a CD-ROM version, which had better graphics, and then like the older like 80s uh, version. That probably was the one that I played. That's the one that I played too. It was the older, like uh, more pixelated graphics one. We had we had one, uh, one computer at our school in mm-hmm. the lab that had a CD-ROM drive. Yeah, yeah. And um, everything else at Math Blaster. <laughs> yep. And I, I actually found this game pretty fun. Uh, the only real thing that I remember enjoying about the game was the little jetpack level where you press a space bar and then you would jetpack up into one of the alien ships and it would give you like a question like, what's two plus two? And you'd have like two, four, and six and you'd have to like jetpack jet over to the, the right one. Uh, that's yeah. kind of neat. Yeah. And, you know, it was really, really simple, but it, it was gamifying um learning basically yeah and i i i felt it was um really really cool um looking back on it i probably have a better nostalgic feel about the game than i did as an actual like a uh, kid at the time but uh yeah See, that, that's the thing I don't, I don't know about that because i feel like at the time like uh, for our generation specifically mm-hmm. video games were still a fairly new thing yeah you know and it's not not as crazy as now, where I feel like uh, a a kid at this point would be like, "Oh, Math Blaster's stupid," or like um, a lot of the educational games would look kind of primitive kinda, to them. Yeah, 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 because I know, of what like, they have access my, to. Um, my my cousin's kid for their birthday got a um, Leapfrog uh, computer uh, game thing, and it was it's like a touchpad. It's like a tablet, basically. Yeah, with a bunch of like. Um, different matching games and puzzles and word games and letter games and and number games and stuff like that for them. Um, And I think it actually, you can get it more um, add-ons and stuff like that for different uh, games and whatnot. It's been a bunch of years, but I, when I worked at Toys R Us, Mm -hmm. we sold the like leapfrog stuff and there was like cartridges at the time. Yeah. It's basically the exact same thing as that. Just a a newer uh, version of it. But uh, yeah, Math Blaster was cool because it taught me about jetpacks and math. So jetpacks and math. It, thumbs up in my opinion. Um, but did you ever play any of the Sim games um, early, like a uh, Sim City or Earth or Ant? I actually played a little bit of Sim City, okay. like the original one, on my 386. Oh, okay. When we eventually got a 386. Right. Yeah. That. Um. I I had um two of these, and the school had Sim Ant. But the um, yeah, man. Your school had Sim Ant, the Sim City and Sim Ant on its computer. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, in grade five, it was really cool. Sim Ant. Yeah, I think it was one of the teachers. On school and computers. They 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 brought it in and installed well, you it. Had, you had a teacher that was pretty rad. Yeah, he was pretty cool. Um, Sim Ant. But uh, yeah, it was kind of neat. Um, everybody has their own preferred version and stuff like that, but uh the the games were kind of neat because like even like sim earth which is 
I, I don't even rem- remember that game very well. I just remember it being extremely difficult and then eventually getting frustrated and throwing comets at the Earth. Because <laughs> I'm just like, whatever. That's what happened in, to the dinosaurs, right? So life has started. Let's just nuke it and humans will show up. But that's not the way it works. <laughs> nope. But, yeah, you know, these types of games teach you about resource management and their simulations about planning and stuff like that and uh, different management of... Um, AI basically and yeah. that AI just simulates like either waterways or resources and uh, like uh, people management and stuff like that which is primitive in some of the older games but like even like nowadays if you look at some of these games they're very sophisticated in like what well, the yeah, AI the, needs and stuff. The Sim Cities that are out now like you've got to do like infrastructure. Mm-hmm. You yeah. have to you have to have like even the neighboring Sewer cities, systems. yeah. Even the na- neighboring cities affect what's going on and the different people and their style of their personas and stuff like that affect like what types of jobs they need and stuff like that. Which is a type of resource management, which is yeah. interesting because it it helps you um, if you're if you become better at the game, you learn those types of skill sets, which is um, you know managing your resources and assets and, and time basically because you got to do it in a certain amount of time or else you get voted out of office or whatever yeah that's true yeah yeah uh and w- I, don't, I don't remember this game very well but uh we figured we would mention it just because we're in canada and like all the max had it um yeah. cross country canada Ugh. <laughs> i hated this game <laughs> i hated this game so much why did you hate this game it was on every computer in the computer lab yep um and the first time I saw, I saw some kids playing it, and I was like, "Oh, that looks fun!" Mm-hmm. And I loaded it up, and I'm like, "What?" Yeah, and for context, this game is, um, it's a driving simulator. I guess so. Yeah, and basically, you're a truck driver. You're a truck driver, yeah, and you, it's it's a resource management game where you're managing your sleep, your fuel, um, whether or not you pick up a hitchhiker, uh, yeah, and and your goods, up. and you have to deliver goods from like city to city, basically. Yep. And it, there's an American version as well, um, but you basically cross country USA. Yeah, and you basically travel from like you, you might start in Toronto or something. And you got to deliver something to Halifax, and you got to deliver something to Vancouver or something like that. And uh, yeah, it, it was interesting because like it had a geography aspect to it, and I, I guess that's why the computer labs had it was because you learned about cities in Canada. Plus, it like it kind of popped up like interesting things like mm-hmm. as you're going past like if you were coming up to like uh sudbury you might see the like what is it a big nickel Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it's a big nickel yeah yeah and one thing that i learned from this game was don't pick up hitchhikers because you get pulled over by the police uh one thing that i learned from this game and this was my only experience with this game Mm -hmm. um i found out how to put the chains on oh yeah for the winter for those who aren't in the know um when you're driving a a large truck uh, especially going through the mountains, yeah, you need to put chains on your tires for the traction because with all that weight pulling you backwards, it's it's a mess. Anyways, mm-hmm. if you don't chain up during that season, you will get fined. Now, if you chain up anywhere else, you will probably get a ticket, <laughs> and that's all I would do. I would you'd start off in like Toronto or something, and I'm yep, chain up right away. <laughs> get like five minutes down the road and like cops pull you over and trips done all right (laughs) done forget it game over this game sucks (laughs) yeah looking back on it it wasn't that great of a game but i mean it was an educational game we had in school uh but you had a couple of educational games that you played uh as a youth that you wanted to talk about yeah so i like i said i i really only had the experience of um either at school Mm mm-hmm um, which I did have access to a couple of the similar things that you did, like Cross Country Canada, right. um, Math Blaster. Um, but uh, so the same friend that I would play uh, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego at right. um, had other educa- – he only had educational games. That's probably the only games that his mom would buy him. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he also had um, – I mean, he had Mario was missing, mm-hmm. which I thought about mentioning. I I mentioned it anyways, but it is in no way educational. It's a geography game. Sure. Crap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he did have 
these uh, Super Solvers series. Okay. Um, I remember playing a lot of Treasure Mountain. Okay. And Midnight Rescue. Right. And yeah, I mean, they were Midnight Rescue was for older kids, I guess. Okay. Because it was like word puzzles. Oh, okay. You'd you'd solve these word puzzles, and then you would get. Uh, you had to figure out which of the robots haunting haunting the school okay. uh, were actually the master of mischief in disguise. Oh, okay. And you would get four clues, and then those four clues would – you'd have to get pictures of each robot too. Right. And then that would let you know who was the master of disguise or oh, okay. master of mischief. It wasn't that good. I mean, educational games, looking back, I did – I grabbed some footage from both of these games, mm-hmm. and I will say of the two now, mm-hmm. Treasure Treasure Mountain is more fun. Right. Um, and yeah, Treasure Mountain, you're just like climbing up this mountain. You're uh, throwing coins mm-hmm. in front of like rocks and stuff. Right. Sometimes you get a key which will take you up to the next level of the mountain. Sometimes you'll get a toy, which is your treasure. Oh, okay. So you're trying to collect treasures as you go up. When you get to the top, you throw your treasure that you've acquired throughout the game right. down this slide. Mm-hmm. The master of mischief, who is in all of the games, is up at the top. He gets very upset, uh, fumes, and you jump down the slide yourself and start over again. Oh, okay. It is the weirdest gameplay loop. But what you're doing <laughs> is you're catching these elves that have scrolls. Okay. And each scroll will have, like, a little word puzzle on it. Oh, okay. A very simple word puzzle. Like, it'll be, like, there might be, like, cat, bat, dog Okay. will be the words on there. And, like, your little hint might be, like, which one of these doesn't fly? Or which one of these can fly? Oh, okay. Like, they're super simple. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, I, fa- I honestly found playing... Um, Midnight Rescue, I got kind of mad at it because it, I failed one of the puzzles. Yeah, you were showing me the puzzle that you failed. That was kind of funny. I cut out the footage because I was embarrassed. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I failed this game for like, it's like five, like grade five kids, mm-hmm. and but the thing is, like, it was the they they wanted a headline for a game, mm-hmm. and I'm like. I picked what I thought was going to be the best headline. Yeah, and you showed it to me, and I made a comment that it's like, well, if you read the headline that they want versus the headline that you chose, the one is more clickbaity, and that's kind of the society that we live in now. So if this was made in 2019, I bet you... Mine would have been right, (laughs) because mine was way more clickbaity. Yeah. Whereas theirs was like, theirs was a better alliteration. Mm -hmm. It was just like all of these. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's clever. Real journalists, like... Title. Whereas mine was like, like three tips to get better hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. And then I also, oddly enough, on the Sega Genesis, mm-hmm. I played quite a bit of uh, Richard Scary's Busy Town. For those who remember episode one. Yeah. That was one of my like prize pieces of my collection was Richard Scary's Busy Town. Yeah. And I played a ton of it when I was a kid. It, mm-hmm. I mean... It wasn't over the top educational, but you were doing interesting things, and like it was on a Genesis, mm-hmm. so like you didn't have a lot of the options that you would have with a PC. Like you couldn't you couldn't type or um, anything like that. Right. But uh, you know, you like you built a house, um, you moved some stuff, you did like deliveries to various addresses. You had to make like prepare meals for people. So I mean, there was like. It was uh, like matching games and right. a lot of memory stuff, but mm-hmm. it was, I'm calling it educational, especially the game where you get to play as the wind and mess with the pig. <laughs> you just blow his hat on down the beach, and when he goes to pick it up, you blow it away again. I learned how to be a jerk to pigs. <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, yeah, it's a little bit of our, our, our history with, uh, with educational games kind of as we were growing up. I mean, it's interesting for... I probably more interesting for us mm-hmm. because uh, like computers were really just coming into schools as we were young. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's whereas nowadays, I'm sure schools have like. Well, like, you're required to have like a Chromebook or a laptop in high school now. Yeah, like, 
Yeah. Whereas, like, I know when I was in high school, you couldn't use the internet for, uh, you couldn't cite internet sources. Yeah, you weren't allowed to. Even um, early Wikipedia was, like, shunned upon, and now it's not as shunned upon. No. To be fair, some things on Wikipedia aren't properly cited. But, yeah, like, I don't... Mean, do your due diligence and actually... Definitely don't believe everything you read on the internet yeah, still, yeah. but, I mean, there are, v- like, valuable resources to use on there, and mm-hmm. there even... There was back when we were in high school, yeah. but they just I, I remember options. I actually had the... Um, this encyclopedia, like like official uh, encyclopedia uh, for the computer, and it was just a text version of the encyclopedias with some pictures and stuff like that and some video clips. Yeah. And my grade four teacher wouldn't let me use it because it wasn't the real encyclopedia. I'm like, I think they're owned by Encyclopedia Britannica. Like... Yeah. It, the, <laughs> the case says Britannica. Yeah. We just don't have like 40 volumes sitting yeah, on a shelf somewhere. It came somewhere. with our CD-ROM drive. Like, give me a break. Yeah. And my mom had to have a discussion with her. Actually, it was probably in Carta. Uh, it was the one. It was the one before on Carta. I'll will find the picture and put it up here for which one it is that I have. But uh, yeah. Um. But yeah. So um, another thing that games um can do and attempted to do to me at least was teaching me how to type. Um. And I. Some people don't necessarily think this is as useful of a skill, but uh, I I would disagree if you're going into tech. Um, I think most people would, but the thing is that, you know, there was some early applications uh, that are pretty primitive with teaching how to type, and uh, we used one of those in grade nine, but uh, before um, before then, for me anyway, I had um, Mario teaches typing, and that's one of the ways that I attempted to learn how to type, and I sort of, like, I, I could glance at the keyboard and, like, finger peck away, um and at like the low levels but it it kind of was a stepping stone at least um and then i actually uh forced myself to learn how to type um to pass a course (laughs) grade nine and uh yeah so did you ever play like mario teaches typing or anything you know what i mean for me the the whole like typing game thing Mm -hmm. It just, I, I totally missed it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I still did typing in school because keyboarding was a class. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like Mario teaches typing, like wasn't overly fun and it wasn't that great of a game, but like it, it kind of a, a set accomplished what it set to do in my opinion. Now, if you would have hit me in grade nine with typing of the dead, mm-hmm. I'd have been all over that. Yeah. I would probably be like a home row wizard. <laughs> do, I, do they use that anymore? Is that still a thing? Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, I, I type like a, a bird you drop on a keyboard. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a lot of, right. But uh, I mean, I, I'm still pretty quick. Mm-hmm. A quick bird, <laughs> three birds. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you would have given me something, if you would have gamified it for me. Yeah. I would have had a lot easier time because uh, a lot of the software that they had was so dry. Yeah, it was just it showed you the keyboard and it would like show you where to put your hands via picture and then it would just have a line of text that you're supposed to type. And it's, it's like, like do type it this faster. as fast as you can. Now do it again and faster. And then it gives you like it's your like words a, per a, minute a, of mistakes. Space, S, 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 space, D, 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 but space, there's, there's rinse, repeat no, for the entire keyboard. There's no like, stakes. Yeah, no. Give me a zombie lurching towards me and then pop up like, blanket. <laughs> ah, all right, quick. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's dead. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, like, no, I agree. Typing of the Dead for the Dreamcast was a pretty awesome game. Yeah, and that's like, it's that gamification to, um, like, secretly teach you. Yeah, and it's weird because, like, I feel like game kind of came out of nowhere, too, because it was just, like, one, it was for a console, like, and... It had a keyboard. I know. The Dreamcast has a keyboard because yeah. it had the whole online thing. But it was like, like a low-grade PC. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it had Windows CE on it. Yeah, man. It was An internet browser disc? Yep. That came with the console, yeah. But yeah, it, it was just <laughs> weird because like, you would think of this type of software being something that would be on a PC. Is kind yeah, you definitely think that would be yeah. more PC-based. Yeah. But... but yeah, another um, thing that games can do and are kind of doing more of as time goes on is uh teaching languages and um you have a couple stories about um actually language through yeah so i mean i guess the the older story would be um 
when uh, uh, my wife was going to Japan, mm -hmm. um, I didn't invite me, but uh, it it was a girls' trip, and Fair yeah, enough. like they planned it out, you know, like a year and a half or a year in advance, right? Because I mean, Japan's super expensive; it's a big trip. Mm -hmm. So she had picked up um, my Japanese coach, okay, for the DS. Uh, Ubisoft did a series of mm -hmm. like my coach games. Yeah, I believe there was like a French and Spanish, yep. uh, Chinese, yeah, and then they had some like non language based ones as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, she picked that up and worked at it fairly diligently. Right, and like I mean, at this point, she doesn't know like the odd thing, right? Will kind of mm -hmm. like pop into her head, but uh, at yeah, that's you know, the thing she, about language. If you don't use it, you definitely it's lose gone. it. And uh, yeah, but it she learned enough to get them comfortably through their trip to Japan. Like she could, she could read read enough of signs mm -hmm. to be able to like fill in the blanks. Right. Um. Yeah, like it's it's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. And that and like that was probably a thirty dollar game. Right, because I I don't think the DS any of the DS coach games were more than thirty bucks mm -hmm. when they launched. Like they weren't. Yeah, and um, uh, we were looking at this before um because I wanted to see it because I didn't know that the DS had like language learning um software um uh, and it actually spoke to you too. It, it would um uh, have listening aids whenever you click on the the different words that you're learning and stuff like that too which is very useful because it's like it's right there as opposed to having to listen to the the cd or the cassette or the the audio file or whatever yeah um, like generation you're you using could, you could take it wherever you were going like it, mm -hmm. it's you could have it with you on the bus yeah. you could spend like just flip it open spend 15 minutes mm -hmm. and do like a couple lessons or like a lesson yeah um and it was it was progressive. It would unlock stuff as you go through. Right. Um, like as you get further, you mm -hmm. know, you'd have little testing points and that, and it it really helps her. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for me, right, it's less of a game, but it's gamification. Yeah. Um, I had picked up Duolingo mm -hmm. probably about six months before we went to Venice. Okay. Uh, just knowing that, like. I have some dietary restrictions uh, as well as Jen and uh, just to kind of give me an idea, mm -hmm. like help us get around, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, basic conversational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I knew we were going to, like we were spending a week in Venice and we were going to, we had, we picked up a bus pass. Right. So we were going to be taking the bus everywhere mm -hmm. with the water bus. Yeah. But uh yeah, so you could kind of get an idea as to like stops and all that kind of stuff, and I spent I probably spent fifteen minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe a little bit more when I had extra time. Maybe a little bit less if I was kind of busy. Right. But yeah, but average fifteen on uh, Duolingo, mm -hmm. and I had enough Italian to get me through that trip. That's awesome. I couldn't like I occasionally remember words now mm -hmm. where I'm like, oh yeah, right, or like I see something and it like triggers and i'm like i know what that means right but for like i w i was impressed with myself when i got there mm -hmm. and i was seeing words and hearing things and i'm like oh i know what that is yeah i know what you mean i can say what i want mm -hmm. like i can express to you what it is that i need mm -hmm. um and again it's that like gamification mm -hmm. you know you have tears i have re you have rewards right um and it it really dangles that carrot and it helps you get to that next that next point and it helps you get this skill that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise and like Duolingo cost me nothing right it was free yeah there's a ton of different like cell phone apps that are free that teach you um, some basic conversational or they use like flashcards to teach you words and stuff like that and a lot of them are free and they for you know, like you were saying just basic conversation introduction kind of like ordering food and stuff like that you can definitely use those types of um you know you can't hold a political debate with somebody in their language no. but you can definitely say no, hello but... and how are you and i would like this or I yeah can't eat can that. i can i get a water mm -hmm. where's the bathroom yeah glass of wine please like <laughs> um 
we're not American. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't Stop think that, being angry. <laughs> I don't think that really matters anymore. But uh, no, it was. It's just it. It was free. Mm-hmm. And for, I, I mean, for what I picked up, would have probably been like at least you know a month or two of classes. Yeah. For like, who knows how much? Mm-hmm. Probably at least like thirty or forty dollars a class. Yeah. If that. Hmm. Um. And then, like my my time, at least an hour of a week, yeah, if not more. So, I mean, the amount of time that you can put into something like this, and the returns that you get, it's great. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then on, but moving on, uh, not to go on about languages all day. Mm-hmm. We also have um, like uh, puzzle slash. Um, like word games. Yeah. Yeah, games that basically work on your cognitive skills. Yes. And um, this is probably the most popular uh, type of educational game with, like, main uh, stream uh, gamers, I would say. This might even be one of the most popular genres of games. It might be, yeah. Because um, the cause Match 3, uh, which would fall into the, the puzzle games, is a very, very popular type of game on yeah, cell phones. Yeah, it's huge. And there's so many different types of them. Everything from, like, uh, yeah, just lots of different things. Well, yeah, you've got like Bejeweled and mm-hmm. Candy Crush and yeah. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I really like these types of games because I play a lot of games such as um, like puzzle games, uh, like Tetris or Poyo Poyo, which kind of make me think about like you know different pattern recognition and things like that that kind of just you know keep my brain active and um uh, uh tetris is planning ahead as well yeah you yes. know you you've got a it's um it's like a single player chess kind of yeah it's 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 a nice solitaire game for sure you know, yeah, you can't you can't think about the move that you're on right now. You have to you have to know what's coming and you have to plan basically where what you're gonna do with your pieces and what types of pieces you can get and whenever you get that piece, hopefully, stupid long pieces. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and you, you know you have a lot of ever other um types of cognitive skill games like the the brain age games which are really really popular in the the ds era and i think they're still kind of making these types of games too well you had you had brain age one and two mm-hmm. i think they stopped at two um but those were two huge ds releases yeah they sold really really well because anyone could play them and yeah. it, it was you know the ds is fairly portable and a lot of parents i knew played this game and even what, elderly what was kind of like neat that. too was that when you played brain age you flipped your ds on the side mm-hmm. so it was more like you were holding a book right um and it looked a little less video gamey because mm-hmm. you had it sideways and then you had your stylus so it, it was more like writing in a notepad yeah um you looked smart playing it <laughs> so yeah. and i mean like the appearance of being smart goes a long way plus mm-hmm. it also like you know it just like throws stuff at you mm-hmm. um i mean i personally I, I played the brain age games a little bit yeah but personally for me i preferred the professor layton series right because it, it did have a story it was still a game mm-hmm. but then you had all of these brain teasers that would get tossed at you mm-hmm. and some of them were really complex like i'm not gonna lie there's you uh you have you can search each like scene for little hint coins. Yeah, and then you can spend those hint coins when you're stuck on a brain teaser, and it'll give you a, a hint, mm-hmm. up to three hints. Um, at least I think it was three. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I went through all three hints, and I'm like, I still have no idea. Like some of those problems were really like. They really required some out of the box thinking, and it's kind of one of those games where the puzzles get harder as you move on over time, right? Like yeah. the the final puzzle is a lot more complex than the uh, the first puzzle. Yeah, like yeah. they 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 build typically like you know if if they start it with a maybe like a matching puzzle where you've got mm-hmm. you know you've got to figure out where these three lines go to. Right. Um, you might have one by the end that has like eight lines, and mm-hmm. what does this match it like? Where does this line up with? And you've mm-hmm. got to like try to worm your way through all these different little things. Um, 
Yeah, per, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Professor Layton series. I thought it was uh, smart. I always every time I closed my DS after playing it, I felt smart. <laughs> Even if I got you stuck like on a you puzzle, actually accomplished something. I was like, yeah, yeah, nailed it. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I like puzzle games is because it actually, you know, like you said, it makes you feel smart. It, you're actually like you're you're doing something that's not just twitch reactions or um like uh resource management or different types of um uh pool management and stuff like that um it's just uh it's it's actual cognitive skills that you're sort of developing on yeah yeah, yeah. kind of like those old um i don't know like uh in early Grades, did you ever get those um those books with like those different puzzle games and stuff like that in them? Yep. Yeah, like the Mensa books and stuff. The, those are that's basically what these types of games are. Which yeah, is... they they just they present them in a they present them through the guise of a game. Yeah, they have a story behind why you're reading the book. Hmm. Yep. But um, really, I think the most interesting thing about education and games, um as a whole is kind of how different um, non-educational games have a bunch of educational information and points thrown into them. And you kind of absorb that kind of stuff through osmosis. Um, And these kind of games are sort of like uh, teaching you history or mythology, uh, things about religion and like life management skills and politics. uh, Yeah. Politics and, you know, all different types of things that are, are, are interesting to people and not necessarily, it's not like, uh, arithmetic or writing but the you know like if you play age of empires for example like that that game was originally kind of um marketed as as kind of like a a sub-educational game because you were learning a lot about ancient civilizations and stuff like that yeah because they had real life civilizations and units in them although it was a rts game that you just built units and destroyed your enemies they um had um really interesting campaigns in them where you really learned about how the Egyptians uh, built up their empire, and then like you build a wonder at the end of the first campaign, and you learn about like Greece, and you learn about like the other civilization, and you can also go through a campaign where you learn about the Romans and things like that. And it, I found that game really interesting because uh, it basically introduced me to ancient civilizations and made me want to take like history in high school and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Like a lot, of, oddly enough, a lot of what I know about medieval civilizations mm-hmm. comes from age of empires too yeah playing through the campaign mm-hmm. like i would not know about um like charlemagne or i way less about like joan of arc mm-hmm. uh, william wallace mm-hmm. there was a a pretty good like scottish campaign yeah uh better than braveheart <laughs> um because it's interactive right exactly yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, and uh, even Civilization is a good example of this because although it doesn't necessarily take you through campaigns where you're learning about uh, things in history um, so much per se and you're kind of just playing an open world um, game where there's a bunch of different civilizations that actually existed with people, uh, rulers that actually existed, what you can do is there's um, in the newer games and um, even in the, I think the original manuals for like Civ 2, there'd be like little blurbs and information snippets about the leaders and stuff like that, that if you went out of your way, you could definitely learn about some of these different civilizations and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the the new newest game has like, mm-hmm. or I guess I should say the newer games because... The, Five and six both have it. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can get in deep. Mm-hmm. Like it'll give you tons of background information on like the wonders, um, even like the like the different religions, yeah, uh, the different political styles. Mm-hmm. Like, you can get way in there um, and learn a lot more than you would be expecting. Yeah, it's it's kind of like um, it's like surprise uh, education. Yeah, exactly. It's like an encyclopedia inserted right into the game for you know your own leisure, basically, which is really cool because you don't have to. Um, uh, go over all of that, but you 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 certainly can uh, if you, if you want to to look into it. And it's it, I do uh, from time to time. It's really interesting. Yeah, like sometimes you you feel like you need you reference back to it because you're like, well, why? Mm-hmm. Why would I? Why would I make this choice over that choice? Yeah. So you look, you just dig a little bit further down. And you're like, 
oh, okay, that's why. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the last type of game we wanted to talk about is kind of period piece types of games because, like, you play the Assassin's Creed uh, games a lot. Yep. Um, and those are very period piece. You know? Yeah, and they're, I mean, obviously the the Templars versus Assassins is not real. Are you kidding? I probably not real. <laughs> um but a lot of the a lot of the figures that they deal with are yeah exactly cuz you know there there were assassin guilds and there were templar and they're making their own story off of that but it's just really interesting cuz you know well they're they're always set during like periods of through history right yeah. like you have um the unity wasn't during the french revolution mm-hmm. so you can learn a lot about that you've got um i mean Black Flag was at the, I guess it was at the end of piracy. Right. The end of the golden age of piracy. But still, like, you had all of these actual real historical figures. Yeah. Like Blackbeard. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the newer ones, like, you have the one that's in Egypt, and there's a lot of lore and, in like, uh, inserted mythology in that game with Egypt. And, and then uh, also, Greece as Greece well, because Greece is yeah. the newest one. And um, a- a- time in ancient history and stuff like that, which is really, really cool. And I think I think part of it now is that games are trying to tell more realistic stories. Yeah. And a part of telling a realistic story and delivering a realistic experience is being able to... Be authentic with, like, its lore... Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like, even God of War, for example, which takes place, the newest one, uh, which takes place in um, kind of like the the Viking area and uh, Netherlands and, or... They deal with a yeah. lot of, a lot of Norse countries. mythology. Yeah. And a lot of it is fairly accurate. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they, they There's take different some interpretations license. and stuff like that. And they, like you said, they take their licenses. But it's, you know, at least it it has its roots and if you are interested in that then it'll intrigue you and you can look into uh different um yeah i I actually research and stuff like that uh, like a week ago i got a message from a friend of mine who just started playing god of war Mm -hmm. and i myself am a big fan of of well i'm a big fan of mythology in general Mm -hmm. um but i enjoyed the norse mythology i like i like the stories they're a lot of fun and he messaged me and he's like is he's like is odin really a jerk like is that true (laughs) I'm like, yeah, not, yeah, not the Marvel one. He but. is, he's, <laughs> he's kind of a jerk. I mean, any any big figure is sort of a jerk. Yeah, because he's like a hot headed figure who believes he's basically unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, my all all the decisions that he makes benefit himself. Mm-hmm. Um, Very self centric. But that's totally other show. But no, it's just it's interesting them. Uh, like you have developers actually like researching mm-hmm. history, yeah, to deliver these experiences. I mean, there's a lot of times that a period piece will come on TV, or you know, I'll walk in and Jen will be watching a a documentary on, um, like medieval kings and queens and whatever, and I'm like, I don't know who that is. Yeah, I stabbed them in Assassin's Creed. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, spoiler alert, Genevieve. Yeah. I took them out. I know who it was. It was Ezio. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, again, it, it digs back to that trying to deliver a more authentic experience. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, uh, what's your favorite educational game? Yeah. Let us know. The comments down below. Down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. And we will see you next Wednesday. See you next week.